because it is liberty alone that fits a man for liberty. One of his philosophies was that for inmates to stop coming to jail, to prisons, they had to take responsibilities for themselves. And he, he looked for ways in the prison system to help inmates take on this responsibility. One of the things he developed was something called a mutual welfare league, an inmate governed body, which was totally unheard of at the time, and is, and is actually unheard of even today, where the inmates would form a court of such, they would even met out discipline to other inmates. They got other inmates involved in sporting activities. They had a commissary way back then. They even had a token economy. Uh, their motto was, do good, make good. By 1916, Osborne was forced out by more conservative elements, but the Mutual Welfare League and many of his forward-thinking policies lived on. 1921 began the term of Warden Lewis Laws. He almost single-handedly engraved the name Sing Sing in America's culture. He too was a great prison reformer, but he was also a tireless promoter who wrote books, performed on radio shows, and appeared in newsreels. Sing Sing Prison. From within its walls, Metrotone brings a message of profound import to every father and mother in America. Listen to Warden Laws lay bare one of the nation's most appalling problems. From my desk within the walls of Sing Sing, I see daily the constantly increasing numbers of boys and young men who are committed to prison. A very great proportion of these boys could have been made into law-abiding, resourceful citizens. Here is a group I would like you to scrutinize. He hoped his media efforts would deter youth from a life of crime. You may be shocked by their youth, yet they are typical of the small army of young men that make up a major portion of the population of our prisons. We have come to the aid of our failing banks. We have a corps organized to save our forests. Why haven't we some plan for youth that will take our young people off the road? That road that leads them year after year in a constant procession to the gates of our penitentiary. Laws also allowed many Hollywood movies to film in the prison, further enhancing the legend of Sing Sing. I'm doing life, 199 years, so no pardon, no parole. And you can't crash over those walls in a million years. The only chance is to get to the courthouse and try it from there. Where do I come in? Such classic dramas as Each Dawn I Die, Angels with Dirty Faces, and Law's own book, 20,000 Years in Sing Sing. Laws often invited Major League Baseball teams to play against the Mutual Welfare League team known as the Black Sheep. You think he'll sail home? The order, he's had enough practice sailing. The story goes that Babe Ruth's longest home run, a 620-foot blast, was hit over the wall at Sing Sing. It was during Law's tenure that Sing Sing Prison was entirely rebuilt. The old cell block was overcrowded and outdated. There was talk of closing Sing Sing altogether. However, in 1926, it was decided to build two massive new blocks up the hill from the original prison. A and B blocks became two of the largest cell houses in the world and are still in use today. Laws also witnessed hundreds of electrocutions during his time, but he was always an outspoken critic of the electric chair. He once said, I realized that the most horrible crime that can be committed is the killing of a human being. And likewise, the most horrible punishment that can be imposed is the killing of a human being. Laws was respected by both staff and inmates a sentiment that was evident when his wife died in 1937. Their warden's house was on the edge of the prison at the time, and, and part of her 
Her funeral was that every single inmate filed single file out through the, the gates and, and passed her, her casket and back in. Lewis Laws retired in 1941 after 19 years, the longest tenure of any warden in Sing Sing history. True to form, he played to the media until the very end. So it's farewell to the big house by one who's seen thousands of prisoners come and go. Today, this unassuming building near the old cell block is the Sing Sing vocational shop. But the origins of this structure will forever be intertwined with perhaps the most controversial means of punishment ever devised by man. This was once the Sing Sing Death House, the home of the electric chair. During the 19th century, the most common method of capital punishment was the gallows. But hanging had always been a gruesome and haphazard affair. New York's legislature looked to electrocution as a more humane method. However, the motives behind the creation of the electric chair are far more insidious. During the 1880s, a fierce competition had developed between Thomas Edison and rival George Westinghouse. Each wanted their electrical systems to become the method of choice for supplying power to America's cities. But Edison's DC current was, in fact, more expensive and less efficient than the Westinghouse AC current. So Edison embarked on a smear campaign against his competitor. The Edison company was determined to show that Westinghouse AC current uh, was very dangerous uh, to life and that there were more fatal accidents as a result of this. So they dispatched a team of engineers throughout the Northeast to demonstrate the dangers of this, and they usually did it by killing a few animals using Westinghouse current. Prison officials took note of these demonstrations and developed an electric chair for the painless and instantaneous execution of human beings. On August 6, 1890, at Auburn Prison, William Kemmler, who had murdered his lover with an axe, became the first victim of the electric chair. Prison officials hailed the event as marking a new era in humane punishment, but actually the execution did not go well. It was gruesome and far from instantaneous. Kemmler's death began a grisly period of trial and error where executioners worked to perfect the use of the chair. But most executions were accompanied by revolting accounts of burning flesh, foaming mouths, and exploding eyeballs. Edison was quick to capitalize on negative publicity, and he chose electrocution as the topic of one of the first motion pictures ever produced. This 1901 dramatization shows the chair being tested with light bulbs before the victim is let in for the electrocution sequence. The usual pattern was an electric shock was administered of about 2,000 volts for about three or four seconds. That was then reduced down to about 500 volts, and it went back up then to 2,000 volts. And there was this up and down process that lasted about two minutes. The expectation, and at least the doctors who testified to this, is that in the first three seconds, the inmate died instantly because of the size of the voltage. Uh, usually, he reached about 140 degrees body temperature, which was sufficient to boil the brain. Sing Sing's first electrocution was performed in 1891 in a chair nicknamed Old Sparky. At this time, three New York prisons had electric chairs, but in 1914, it was decided to build the state's only death house at Sing Sing. There's a growing recognition that it ought to be done in one site where a kind of specialty develops in taking care of this. Uh, the prison officials, for example, took great pains to prevent inmates from committing suicide. Uh, there are examples of heroic surgery to save inmates who ingested various things they found in an effort to kill themselves to cheat the chair. No one should be allowed to cheat the chair. 614 electrocutions were performed at Sing Sing, the last in 1963. 
It seems the deaths were almost always at the center of an emotional and contentious debate. In 1920, the flamboyant investigative journalist Nellie Bly became the first woman to witness an electrocution. The subject was one Gordon Hamby. Hamby tried to be blasé about the electric chair. As he was strapped in, he told the witnesses he'd gladly try anything once. But Nellie Bly was horrified by the proceedings, calling for an end to this punishment. She wrote, Thou shalt not kill. Was that commandment meant alone for Hamby, or did it mean all of us? 1928 brought new controversy when Ruth Snyder and her lover, Judd Gray, were executed for the brutal murder of Snyder's husband. One of the witnesses to Snyder's electrocution was a New York Daily News photographer who had secretly strapped a camera to his leg. The next morning, Snyder's final moment was on the front page of papers across the country, causing a national outcry against the electric chair. In 1944, Louis Lepke Buckhalter was executed. He was the head of the U.S. Crime Syndicate and its enforcement arm, Murder Incorporated. Two of Buckhalter's flunkies, Louis Capone and Emmanuel Mendy Weiss, also died in the chair that night. Loyal to the end, Capone and Weiss ordered the same dinner as their boss. Lepke assured them the fix was in and they wouldn't die. Lepke was wrong. But perhaps the most controversial of all was the 1953 electrocution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the young couple who were convicted of selling atomic bomb secrets to the Russians. Their sentence triggered violent protest and the execution became one of the most celebrated media events of the era. Crowds gathered outside the prison waiting for a reprieve from the Supreme Court or President Eisenhower. But the order never came and the Rosenbergs became the first civilians executed for treason in the United States. Rabbi Irving Koslow was the prison chaplain at the Rosenbergs' execution and has been present at 17 electrocutions. Koslow would counsel the condemned man for years before his execution. From this experience, he has a rare insight into the psychology of the condemned inmate and death by the electric chair. The major difference between dying in a hospital and dying at the chair is a major difference. Was that in a hospital, a patient never knew the exact moment they might leave this world. Whereas you, when you put in electric chair, you knew in advance that at least the sing sing, at Thursday night, 11 o'clock, you would be in that chair, and a minute or so later, you'd be dead. Executions all followed a similar sequence. The day before, the condemned man is moved from the death row cell block to a group of cells near the electric chair, an area known as the dance hall. Here, final preparations are made, including shaving the convict's head. Kozlo would comfort the inmate through these final preparations. On Thursday, Kozlo would spend the entire day with the inmate and accompany him until the end. I would spend time in that cell with him. And all day long, we'd prayer, a conversation, what exactly was going to happen in that execution room, uh, life after death, a variety of topics were covered. Comfort, uh, was it painful? To me, death was moving along slowly but surely. At about 6 p.m., he is offered his last meal. For last supper, they're given anything they want at 6 o'clock. Not one inmate or one person that was ever touched any of that food. They could order steaks and ice cream, and they sent it all to the, uh, back to the wings they came from, back to the death house inmates. Finally, the excruciating wait draws to a close and the guards come for the condemned man. By the time a knock on the door came, which is about one or two minutes to 11, as far as I was concerned, that man or woman was half dead. Really, 
it was no longer as articulate or as responsive as he had been Wednesday and Thursday, you see, all day. And I was telling him, look, follow me. There'll be two correctional on either side of you walking down this corridor, which is maybe 20 feet, no last mile, 20 feet of corridor. And as we got close to the door, it would swing open. I told the man, it's going to swing open. You'll be taken by the two correctional officers. Don't make any comments, because any statement you make to either the officers or to the witnesses or reporters who may be there will be misinterpreted and won't be accurate. I, I, I know that. There'll be two, in, two men inside beside a wooden chair. They'll seat you down quickly. They're going to put something over your eyes. You'll be electrodes will be tied to your head and to your leg. It'll be very quick. I'll be right in front. I'll be as close to you as I am to you now. I'll stand right in front of you. I'll be on a rubber mat, but I'll be there and I'll offer some prayer. An appropriate prayer that we offer for a person who's going to leave this world. And that's all I can do. As soon as they're strapped in, there's a motion to the electrocutioner and he would lower the electrode. And that was the first shot. Then another shot. The doctor would run over and open the shirt and test him. He said, this man is dead. I'd seen death uh, many times before, both as a rabbi in the army and so forth, so I wasn't shaken by death. But it is a different experience, because I knew at that moment that man was going to die. And, uh, and uh, it's something you never forget. In 1965, the death penalty was abolished in New York State. 30 years later, it was reinstated. But future executions will be performed by lethal injection. Sing Sing holds the unusual distinction of being the only prison with a railroad running through it. Undoubtedly, more than one escape attempt has been inspired by the hope of hopping on board. The most notorious and bloody breakout came in April of 1941. Charles McGale, John Waters, and Joseph Reardon escaped through the prison hospital, killing a guard and later a local policeman. The daring attempt had been planned for more than 10 months with the help of several accomplices on the outside. The plan was set in motion on March 22nd when three guns were smuggled into the prison strapped underneath a milk delivery truck. Waters hid the weapons in the hospital, where he worked as an orderly. Miguel was a prison trustee who had access to tools and rope. He was also an expert locksmith. He made keys to a steam tunnel that ran from the hospital basement outside the prison. On the night of April 13th, Reardon and Miguel faked illnesses and checked into the hospital. Waters slipped them the guns. At 2 a.m., the men made their move. They shot and killed Officer John Harty and scrambled through the 600-foot tunnel. Outside, they used Miguel's rope to lower themselves down to the railroad tracks. Meanwhile, their accomplices waited at the nearby train station with a car and a machine gun. It was here that the foolproof plan began to unravel. The break was ahead of schedule, and when the fugitives arrived, their two friends were having a drink in a local tavern. Then, by pure chance, two Ossining policemen happened upon the SKPs. The ensuing gun battle left Waters and Officer James Fagan dead. Reardon and Miguel made their way to the Hudson River, where they ordered a fisherman, Charles Rohr, to row them across. 
A giant manhunt was launched with over a thousand policemen searching for the killers. Finally, seven hours later, the fugitives were apprehended. After a quick trial, the two accomplices were sentenced to life in prison and Reardon and Miguel died in the electric chair. Sing Sing's last major escape was in 1986 when three men broke out of the school building. Three inmates tied together sneaker shoelaces. They made a rope and they used that to shimmy down the wall and then shimmy down the down to the train tracks and went south towards the city. They didn't get too far. The SKPs were quickly recaptured. Since then, prisoners have been prohibited from having extra shoelaces in their cells. In 1994, the original wall was torn down and replaced by a state-of-the-art cement and security fence perimeter but escapes continue to be a concern. Today, the prison holds over 2,200 inmates. More than 1,700 are in for violent crimes. Officers carry no guns. The only weapon they are allowed is a baton. The reason why you don't carry a gun is they'll take it from you. We're faced with inmates making all kinds of homemade weapons. Uh, they make it out of anything. Uh, piece of bed, piece of chair, they sharpen them. They have 24 hours to do this. And we set up metal detectors, we do pat frisking and stuff like that. But now plexiglass entered the scene. Now they make weapons out of plexiglass. Metal detectors are useless against that. It's a very dangerous place. Wrong word, wrong move, anything could happen at any time. The trick and the secret is being firm, fair, and consistent. You have to be the same way every day. You can't be a nice guy today, a bad guy tomorrow. The reformers that originally created the concept of the prison hoped this new approach to punishment would rehabilitate criminals. 200 years later, prison officials are still wondering if rehabilitation is possible. Today, any inmate comes into the system in New York State has an opportunity to change and, and to be able to get out of prison and have options to not come back. And that starts by, by us in here addressing the reasons he came to prison in the first place. Uh, a number of years ago, an inmate could come into a system like this and go to the yard and lift weights all day. Well, that's not, that's not possible today. Basically, it is up to him still whether he changes or not, but we're going to be uh, making it a little more difficult for him to not address those issues. Now, as one looks at prisons, uh, they seem so much a part and so traditional a part of the criminal justice system that we lose the ability to uh, remember uh, that they were the inventions of one generation, uh, they were not here when Columbus arrived on these shores, and that there is something ultimately odd and strange about them. Where did we ever get the idea that if we put people behind walls in boxes in these artificial odd settings, we would release them better, more likely to be law-abiding? It's very, very strange. Uh, there is this tale uh, of one inmate in the 1970s being asked, well, how is it? Um, how are you finding prison life? Uh, and the inmate responded, look, in, in some ways it's better than I thought it would be. In other ways, it's worse than I thought it would be. And then he paused and went on to say, but you know, I would love to meet the dude who dreamed up shit like this. He must have been made on Mars.